Magnum Pack and Patriots, can you dig it? You're watching the Tap Rack Bang Show. I'm Ryan Frazier, riding shotgun with me as always is the tactical tackle himself, Tyler Witzke. Tyler, how you doing, buddy? Doing pretty good, how are you? Balling out of control, you know me. As always, we invite all of our viewers today to be a pro-gun bully. So if you want to give Joe Biden a good old-fashioned wedgie, go, and, go ahead and hit that like button. If you want to upgrade and make it an atomic wedgie, why don't you go ahead and subscribe? Don't forget to smash the bejesus out of that Liberty Bell to sound the alarm of freedom every time a Tap Rack Bang show drops. What else can they do, Tyler? Don't forget to visit all the links down in the description and become an FLD member. Um, you can help out our foundation. You know, uh, they got a big battle going on with San Jose right now. And, uh, you know, just help out the podcast. You know, we got a link down there. You can donate to us. Everything goes back into the show to mm. help bring you guys ex- exciting, awesome content. Yeah. I don't know why that took so long to get out. But uh, with that, let's get started. Yeah. Well, like, we'll start this show like we start every show with a little bit of t shirt time. It's t shirt time. <laughs> Uh, last week, our winner, um, why don't, well, the question that we asked was, what uh, gun manufacturer released a dope-ass new pistol chambered in 5.7 at this year's SHOT Show? Um, Bubbles, why didn't you tell them who the winner was? Randy Julian? That's right, Randy Julian. <laughs> Randy Julian answered the correct answer of PSA, Palmetto State Armory. We got, our, we got a chance to get our hands on that sweet... PSA 5.7 pistol, and holy cow, is it cool. That thing's awesome. And it's like, got a great trigger, Finally, too. like, a reasonably priced pistol chambered in 5.7, and yeah, the trigger was phenomenal. If, you like, if you've tried the dagger already, the trigger's even better than that. So. Yeah, what well, it hold, like, 26 rounds or yeah, something like wild. that? it's wild. 23-round capacity on these. God, 5.7, that is a lead-slinging badass pistol that I can't wait to take to the range. And it'll be cheaper than all other 5.7 pistols on the market. Uh, the base model is going to start at 499 and then the threaded barrel with the R mark, that's going to be 550 Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Yep, yep, yep. P- poor podcast hosts can afford this. Five, yeah. <laughs> finally, we can get in on the 5.7 fun, except for we probably can't afford ammo. Right. But I digress. This year, if you want to be a... This year. This year. This episode, if you want to be a winner like Randy Julian, who just won himself this dope-ass NAGR... Hell no, Joe T-shirt. You can be the. You can win one for yourself by answering this week's question in the YouTube comments. Be the first to answer correctly, and you'll win yourself a Hell No Joe shirt. Um, this one's pretty simple, and I think a lot of people will get it. I want to know what caliber did the U.S. government replace for their uh, standard issue pistol with the 45 ACP. So, what was the pistol caliber of the U.S. government before 45 ACP? Comment below, win yourself a shirt if you're the first to answer it correctly. There we go. You That's bet. it for t-shirt time. Uh, well, we, we, we had a friend come on to the show this week. What about that? Yeah, yeah. so we invited uh, Brendan Bergero to join the podcast and uh, you know go over some of the constitutional carry states uh, that we're battling with right now and uh, hoping to get a few more in the mix this, this year. But, uh, but don't well, take our word for it. Yeah, let's see what Brendan has to say. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome back to the show the Director of Field Operations for the National Association for Gun Rights, Mr. Brendan Boudreau. Thank you for joining us again, Brendan. Yeah, good to see you guys again. Good to see you. Now, everyone knows that last year you and your team of political troublemakers just (laughs) thoroughly outdid yourselves uh, seeing the passage of five constitutional carry bills into law in five different states, including the big state of Texas. Um, first of all, thank you for your hard work on that. And our people would like to know what's on deck for 2022. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Yeah. And you know, we, we really couldn't have done it without our members. I mean, the, the amount of phone calls, emails, postcards, just troublemaking <laughs> that, uh, that our, our members did in States across the country in 2021 was just awesome. Um, you know, my, you know, of course my team works very hard. Uh, you know, they've deployed in States across the country. Um, I, I did four trips up to Montana myself last year. I mean, there's worse States to have to go to than Montana. Um, let me just, let me just go on the record with that. Like you could have to go to Indiana or something like that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I'll, I'll get to in a minute, but you know, just, just the amount of, of pressure. And you think about, especially with Texas, I mean, to have the second most populous state in the nation pass constitutional carry is, is no small thing. That's, that's Huge. massive. Um, and, you know, NAGR has been working there for, for almost a decade. Uh, 
just it, it goes to show you how no compromise grassroots political tactics make the difference. We can we can pass constitutional carry virtually anywhere using those tactics. Um, so, you know, going into 2022, of course, it's it's hard to match what, what happened in 2021. Sure. And, uh, you know, really, when we start set out in 2021, we're looking at really uh, uh, five states uh, that we're really looking at constitutional carry. So I'm looking at my notes here because I can't even remember them all because <laughs> it's been a month now. And it's, it's been a month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys <laughs> have been all way. over the place. Oh, and it's it's just been. The, the 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 feet dragging by Republican politicians is just astounding. I, I I've been doing this for over a decade now, working in grassroots politics. I shouldn't be surprised by this, but yet I am because it's just incredible when you look at states like Indiana and Alabama. Indiana has super majorities and a go- Republican governor, and they can't pass constitutional carry. Alabama has, you know, it's it's the old South, the good old boys. You know, Alabama Republicans. I'm pretty sure they have super majorities, if not near super, super, super majorities in both chambers. They can't get it done without severe teeth pulling. Um, you know, so it's just it's just it goes to show you that Republicans so often take advantage of gun owners and they just assume that gun owners are going to show up every two years and vote them back into office. And that's where gun owners have to say, no, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. You can't just give them a, a free pass. Because when you get give them a free pass, then you see what happened in uh, in Florida back in 2018, when you had 67 NRA rated Republicans vote for the massive gun control expansion in Florida. Um, so, anyway, that's that's a tangent. Uh, you know, I'm just airing my grievances here. I know we're past <laughs> Festivus at this point, but you know, yeah, I'll go ahead and dive in here. Yeah. Um, you know, Indiana, uh, as I already touched on, it's a favorite state Florida. of yours. Oh, I've been working in <laughs> Indiana, politically speaking, for most of my political career. I'm from Michigan, but, uh, you know, uh, Lord would have it that I, I've done a lot of work in Indiana. And the black you know, we that start, keeps sucking you in. Yeah, it's just it's it's crazy. Um, you know, we started pushing constitutional carry there in 2015. And, you know, it, it's really not that far of a stretch to for Indiana to become a constitutional carry state. Their permit you don't have to have a training requirement for it. It's pretty cheap to get. They've actually made it free because of our grassroots program. Instead of just giving us constitutional carry, they lowered the fee. Then they made a lifetime permit. Then they got rid of the fee entirely. But it's just like it's it's really this last hurdle just to get rid of the permit requirement uh, to get it done. And it kind of show you shows you sometimes how difficult it can be when it's already perceived as being so good. Yeah. You know, I um, think that's a good met. Uh, message for when people get presented with these compromise kind of bills that it's like it's better than what we have but it's not what we're actually fighting for it's going to make the ultimate goal even harder to achieve down the road yeah and yeah they, they just want you to go away so they'll give you a little something yeah the exactly thing. and and, and the key for scraps yeah. yeah and the key for gun owners to say no no we will not settle for that we want all of our rights back Amen. um and and you are elected to do that and if you're not going to, you're you're going to get sent into early retirement. Your your political career is done. So you know, in Indiana, uh, we started off the year kind of with a bang. The Indiana House passed the bill within the first two weeks. Um, went over to the Senate, and it's just been it's just been stuck in a quagmire over there. We had a, a Senate bill filed by Senator Jim Toms, uh, which we were working with him on, but unfortunately, Legislative Services Commission botched the drafting of it, so there had to be some cleanup in committee. And we worked with the senator to get the bill cleaned up, uh, get the amendment cleaned up. And I went down there uh, just a couple weeks ago for a committee hearing that was scheduled. And then the Senate uh, Judiciary Chair, Liz Brown, uh, decided the morning of who's a co-author on the bill, mind you, that she's not accepting amendments and she's not even going to give the bill a vote. And then it's openly hostile to every every proponent of the bill in the hearing. Does that sound like someone who supports constitutional carry to you? No, uh, to me. And it, it just goes to show you she had her name added to the bill, thinking that she could have her cake and eat it too. Yep. Um, so you know, we fast forward now. It's uh, now the first week of February. Uh, SB fourteen, the Senate bill is officially dead uh, because of of, of uh, legislative deadlines. The House bill is still alive. But it was just sent to Liz Brown's committee. And this is something that we've been we've been trying to pressure the Senate president pro tem, Roderick Bray, not to send it to this committee. We we have it on good authority that there's a senator who chairs another committee who said, send it to my committee. I will pass it. I will hold hearings and pass the bill. 
But what does Roderick Bray do? He sends it to uh, Senate Judiciary Committee wow. where Liz Brown, you know, unless unless Bray does one of these, you know, you pass the bill or you're losing your chairmanship deals. Uh, he, he's he's killing the bill. And and of course, we see the governor's fingerprints on this. Um, you know, quite often one chamber is closer to the governor than than another in various sure. states. And some and quite and frankly, quite often it's the Senate that does the governor's dirty work in states. And that's that's kind of what we're seeing here is they're not telling us anything. They're not talking to any of the gun groups and telling us what what they're going to do. And next thing you know, it's sent off to to Senate Judiciary we, where we've made it absolutely clear that's a problem. So we'll see what happens. We're we're doubling down. We've, we're up on the airwaves. We're running radio ads. We're doing uh, targeted calls. We're doing Facebook. We're doing lit drops, uh, emails, and I mean we're just really pounding on them. And hopefully we can get them to to to, to advance the bill. Absolutely. Um, if not, we're going to have to look at some other some other avenues to get stuff done. Um, yeah, you know, we're, we've got we've still got a couple of weeks here, but, you know, those 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 days just melt away so quickly. And yeah. all it takes is, you know, I don't know, a, a global pandemic. To, next thing you know, the legislature is not in session anymore and we lose our opportunity to pass constitutional carry for this year. And uh, just, just to remind people again, Republican supermajorities in Indiana. Yep. yep. They aren't getting it done. So if they don't get it done, that's fine. You know, <laughs> we'll just go. We'll just go have fun in the primaries. Yeah, it's time uh, for some and, rhino hunting. Yeah, expose some of these folks. Our PACs will get involved, and and we'll work on uh, and defeating some of these Republicans that are blocking us. Sounds good to me. Yeah. What's next? <clears throat> what What's the next state on the agenda here? Boy, I, I don't know if I should keep on with my angry streak or, or move to uh, <laughs> move to one that actually has some good news. I'll I'll I'll, I'll go with some good news now. There we go. Spoonful uh, Georgia. Of sugar. Yeah, exactly, Georgia. Um, you know, Georgia, frankly, was not high on our radar this year. Uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a state that has some institutional issues. Uh, you got a lot of rhinos in charge there. But then out of nowhere, we start hearing about uh, about a movement really building to uh, to, to to pass constitutional constitutional carry. Uh, uh, the office of us, uh, uh, Senator Jason and uh, actually reached out to us to get us basically up to date on what's going on. He held a rally in Woodstock, Georgia, where Dudley flew out to speak to. Uh, and, you know, we, we got in touch with a lot of good patriots out there in Georgia who are helping make this happen. And uh, so just this week, uh, we found out last minute, Monday night, um, that they're having a committee hearing the next day. And Bethany Young, um, our, our regional director who's down in Texas, got on a plane the next morning and, and flew to Atlanta to testify in support of that bill. And it passed out of committee. Um, so there's, there's positive progress there. We think that the bill is going to pass out of the Senate uh, with no problems. The house is going to be the problem and okay. we're going to have to, I'm hearing rumors. There's going to be another bill filed in the, in the house. I haven't seen it yet. Um, uh, but regardless, you know, you had the governor come on in, fa- in favor of it. I think you guys talked to Brian Kemp. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Out in, out in shot show, there was a governor's forum and we were able to corner him and get him on the record. And he said, absolutely. When it comes to his desk, it's, it's got his signature. So good yeah. news out of the governor at least. Yeah, absolutely. And you have a lot of these uh, state representatives and state senators who are in new districts who are facing primaries and they, they want that vote so they can go back to the primaries, go to their voters and say, Hey, I did this great big thing. Leave me alone, please. Yep. <laughs> um, so there's positive progress in Georgia, but of course it's going to, it's going to take a, a good, good amount of work to get it done and get it done cleanly. Right. Um, staying in the South, we'll go over to Alabama <clears throat> another state. That's just the scourge of my existence right now. <laughs> um, you know, just the good news is just this week, uh, a, a constitutional carry bill passed out of a Senate committee. Um, and and we think that it's you know, we, we're not going to have problems in the Senate or in the House. We're supposed to have a public hearing this week, but then there's been some backroom wheeling and dealing of making compromises. We were able to beat off an anti-gun amendment that would have um, that would have actually expanded gun free zones in the constitutional carry bill. Um, and. You know, we we started beating on the uh, politically speaking, beating on the, the 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 chairman who was who was pushing this 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 garbage, and of course we were told by certain other individuals that we were hurting our cause, and this guy's a friend, and then lo and behold, he backed off. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, it's amazing what happens when when you hold these politicians accountable. Yeah. You know, 
they 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 hear the grassroots and they back off. So we were able yeah. to save that. There's still some jockeying. We're still trying to make sure it's a clean bill. It's gonna take it's going to take a lot of work over these next couple of weeks to make sure it gets out of the house clean. We, we know the governor will sign it. And we believe that the governor will sign it. Kay Ivey will sign it. It's just a matter of getting it there in enough time and in good order so that we're not going backwards on gun rights. Right. Um, That's the problem with a lot of these state legislatures is it's really a race against time. And if you don't make that cutoff, like years worth of work can be flushed down the toilet and you're starting over from square one. Yeah. Yeah, and, and with Alabama too. Alabama is one of those weird states. They have elections once every every four years, um, so their their election is 2022. It's this year, mm-hmm. so this will be our only opportunity to hold them accountable until 2026. A lot is going to change in yeah. those four years. So it'd be ideal to get it done now because we have the the pressures of the election on them now. Yep. And, you know, ultimately, if, if they kill the bill, we can hold them accountable in the, in the election year. But it'd just be a lot easier. And, and that's yeah. what we try to tell politicians in all these states. I mean, meeting with politicians, meeting with their consultants, I'm just like, just give us the bill. And mm-hmm. we go and we'll, we're going to, you know, you don't have to worry about this yeah. issue anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, there's just so many different special interests they want to placate and get, get their gravy f- from. You bet. Um, and they just want to keep everyone happy. But that's where gun owners have to be the the scrooge you know we have to be the mm-hmm. ones that will never be satisfied until they fully restore our rights absolutely yeah <laughs> and, it, and it seems like you know we kind of talk about how gun owners have been kind of walked on and uh whatnot past couple of years but uh <clears throat> it just seems like politicians are kind of still using that as a status quo and you know gun owners are pretty fed up right now at this point all across the nation yeah and and, you know they're they're wanting to pass constitutional carry and then you know like you said the politicians want to keep everyone happy except for the gun owners because those are the guys we can kind of walk on so yeah we'll take it yeah exactly so it's good that we're taking a stand right now and like getting what we want. Undoing the culture of compromise established by the main st- mainstream gun lobby for decades. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Take some time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, we also had uh, movement in Nebraska, the Cornhusker State, um, recently. Uh, they, uh, our, our regional director, Matt Mimoser, drove out there, flew, flew out there, rather. It's hard to tell which is easier. I mean, you know, from, from Loveland, it's it's a coin toss. What'll be yeah, better. Yep. Um, but he was there to testify in, in committee. And uh, we actually had the, the bill sponsor slap a, a, a stack of our orange postcards down in front of the, uh, the committee of I like over <laughs> almost 400 uh, orange postcard that he received <laughs> from people supporting his bill. And he said that made a difference. Uh, nice. He said that he, he, he noticed that people are, are taking notice of how important this issue is uh, in Nebraska. The problem is, is that, the bill is stuck in an anti-gun committee. Nebraska has this weird unicameral legislature that's nonpartisan, which is absolute hmm. garbage. And so their judiciary committee is controlled by Democrats. Um, but there is an opportunity to to uh, there's a legislative procedure to bring the bill to the floor. Um, and we think there's a uh, there's a good chance of that happening. The question will be is whether or not we can get the votes to make it happen. Um, yeah, well, we were in SHOT Show. We also talked to uh, Governor Ricketts there in Nebraska. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and that's what he had to say is – his plan was that we would have to pull it from committee. And is that what you think it's going to take to get this thing moving? Yeah. I don't think the, that, that Democrat controlled committee is going to give it to us. Makes um, sense. And, you know, so it's, it's very close. While they claim that they're nonpartisan, you know what their labels are. You can yeah. find out what party they register to or based on their voting. Yeah. The Republicans almost have enough votes to do it without the Dems. Um, but it's close. Yeah. And so there's, you know, you got to get everybody to vote right and then some um, to, to get this done. So there's there's a possible play there. We're also, again, trying to uh, beat off um, bad, uh, bad anti-gun amendments. There's possibly some stuff like adding misdemeanor charges for failing to uh, to inform an officer if you're carrying um, in your vehicle wow. due to the duty to inform issue yeah. that uh, um, that uh, that that keeps rearing its head. Yeah. Um, we're hoping we're hoping to be- beat that back. So, um, boy, yeah. Ohio, the Buckeye State. Um, being from Michigan, uh, it, <laughs> it pains me to think that Ohio might get constitutional carry before us. Um, 
you know, they've they've each passed the House has passed their version, Senate has passed their version. What we're hearing is that uh, the Senate version seems likely to move forward in the House. The question will be is if Mike DeWine's going to going to do anything with it. Right. Um, if 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 they take if the legislature takes too long, if the Ohio General Assembly takes too long to take action on it, they they might lose a window of opportunity because the primary for governor is in early May uh, in, in Ohio and. DeWine is facing a, a brutal primary against Jim Renacci and actually a friend of ours, state representative Ron Hood, uh, mm-hmm. just just jumped in the, the governor's race last minute, uh, which I think is, you know, it's it's last minute, but he's got a following. I mean, yeah. he's, he's a he's a pro gun hero. And any more bites that you can take yeah. out of DeWine is good. Absolutely. Um, and so it's it's incumbent upon the uh, the Ohio General Assembly to get this done now. Because after the primary, that pressure, that pressure is going to be gone for for DeWine to to actually sign it. Because if he yeah. wins, if he wins the primary, he doesn't have to sign. He's got nothing carry. to lose. Right. Yeah, he can veto it. Um, and not only that, he even came out publicly saying he would sign it, and then he kind of backtracked on those remarks, if I remember yeah. correctly. So he, he's, he's a flip flopper for yeah. sure. Yeah, and uh, yeah. someone we don't need in the governor's <laughs> office unless he signs it. So yeah. Yeah, that's that's where it's just so crucial for gun owners to put pressure on the General Assembly, say, get it done now, um, yeah. you know, be, before you, we lose the opportunity to put pressure on DeWine. Yeah, DeWine is a political creature. I mean, he's he's supported gun control in the past uh, when he was in Congress in the 90s. He came out in support of red flag and he had his keep Ohio safe measures after the Dayton shooting. And yeah. he, he's not a friend of gun owners. But this just goes to show you that, you know, even. Anyone can become a patriot. Yeah. Uh, a patriot. Any politician can become a patriot. And I, I don't want to actually call them a patriot. The point being is that because of the election, all of a sudden they support a whole wide variety mm-hmm. of issues that we support because they're running for re-election. Right. And we have to use that to our advantage. Yeah. You bet. Um, um, yeah. Boy, Wisconsin, uh, the Badger State. Looks like they're going to pass a version of constitutional carry. Uh, it's going to get vetoed by their governor. Um, but, you know, it's a good thing. Them yeah. passing it, getting roll call votes in the House and the Senate, make the governor veto it. It's made it. It's it's an election issue. Pennsylvania just did that a couple months ago. Yep. Um, I, I, I wish we could get Michigan Republicans to do the same thing up here. But they're afraid of their own shadows right now. <laughs> um, you know, um, you know, I was actually talking with the candidate for attorney general up here. Uh, Tom Leonard today, and he was Speaker of the House the last time the Michigan House passed constitutional carry. Um, and he's the only speaker who helped bring it through. I mean, we poured out uh, grassroots pressure like none other on the Michigan House, but he did the right thing. He brought it up for a vote and, and actually exposed a, like uh, uh, six Republicans who, who voted against it. And he told me, he's like, this is not an issue that is going to cost Republicans elections if you vote right. If you vote wrong, it's going to cost you elections. Yep. But if you if you vote right, this is this is good politics for Republicans in any state, Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida, Georgia, anywhere. Right. Um, so it's just silly that Republicans still are just fighting back against this issue. Um, you know, so. Uh, you know, kudos to to the grassroots in Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania that even though their governors vetoed it and they don't have the votes to override it, they still did it anyway. Um, that 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 takes guts and give them give them kudos for that. So, well, you mentioned Florida. Um, do you want to touch on that? Because that that could be a, a Texas level victory for us if we were able yeah, to get it done yeah. in Florida. <laughs> Boy, Florida, Florida has been a joy uh, <laughs> to, to see what's happening out, down there. I'm. I was joking earlier, you know, I've been looking at uh, working for NAGR since 2014 and Florida's just been it's, it's just been a hauling wasteland yeah. uh, for us, politically speaking. Um, the, the political establishment is very, very strong there. Speaking of the Republican establishment, the establishment gun lobby is well established there. There's just not much movement there. And of course, then in 2018, yeah. they passed this massive expansion of gun control, red flag, uh, waiting periods, banning uh, law abiding adults between 18 and 20 from purchasing long guns. Um, just really gnarly stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so we've been pushing constitutional carry. We've been pushing red flag repeal. Well, this year, really what really kicked off the current storm that's going on there was our, our director down there getting a video of Ron DeSantis si- saying that he would sign constitutional carry if it came to his desk. And Governor DeSantis, to his credit, 
does, didn't hesitate. He said, of course I'll sign. Yeah. Um, but I think that has caught the entire political establishment off, off guard now because now the issue is just popping up everywhere. Um, you know, Matt was just at a rally this week where there, there were people – with signs saying support constitutional carry, wearing hats saying support constitutional carry, harassing politicians saying, where do you support unconstitutional carry? And you get videos of politicians scurrying off to their offices because <laughs> they're afraid of the issue. I love it. But you have the, the Senate president, Wilt Simpson, coming out saying he supports constitutional carry. Um, and you've just got all these politicos that are all of a sudden coming out saying they support it. I mean, yeah. if I thought we were here, uh, if we would have been here a month ago in Florida, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, I still don't think we're going to get it this year. I think it's going to take a couple election cycles to get it done. But who knows? I mean, if, yeah. if Governor DeSantis all of a sudden told the legislature tomorrow um, to to send it to my desk, that that would be a game changer, and we right. could very well have a real fight on our hands. Until then, it's just been fun watching <laughs> watching the political environment just explode. <laughs> right. So absolutely, yeah. I, I think it's good and all that everybody in Florida, you know. Oh, I support constitutional carry, but, you know, talk is cheap, you know. You need to walk mm. the walk. So uh, I think we got you got a good point there. If we can get something moving, it will be tremendous yeah. for us. And but, that turnaround well, I, from 2018 is just mind-boggling. The fact that it's even a conversation after, like you said, going from red flag and all kinds of other nonsense to legitimately it's on our short list of constitutional carry states where it's a real possibility right. maybe yeah. in a year or two, but still. Yeah, well, and 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 just really goes to show you how much the members of the National Association for Gun Rights have have changed the political environment nationwide. When I started at, at NHGR, there are four constitutional carry states. There are now twenty one. That's wild. And and it's just you just look at how it's become the new norm. I, I said that in a in an NHGR newsletter article, and the title of it was "Constitutional Carry: The New Norm." like back in 2017 it was after we just had a couple really good years mm -hmm. and that was when we only had 12 or something like that yeah. and now we're up to 21 and i mean you go i i hear it from politicians from candidates who say i support constitutional carry there was no need for them to say that just a few years ago yeah and and now it's just coming out everywhere where you have politicians saying i support constitutional carry organically because they recognize that it's what they have to do to survive politically. 100%. Yeah. And it's, it's almost like a kind of a Hydra effect where you, you pass it in one state and all of a sudden two new states become a reality. Oh, yeah. Like Kentucky yeah. passes constitutional carry and now Tennessee's like, our neighbor has it. Why don't we have it? Or Oklahoma yeah. passes it. All of a sudden Texas feels left out. Yeah. So with every one we get, it seems like the, we call it the box of political reality expands a little bit in our favor. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep. And obviously, like you said, all credit goes to our members, but a lot of the credit goes to your hard work and the work of your team on the front lines getting it done. And these, you know, state capitals, a lot of which are kind of a miserable place to spend a lot of your time. And I know that it's uh, taken a toll on you over the years, but you never stray away from a fight and you keep coming back for more. And we thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate it. And I know there's a lot of people who put in a lot of time on this issue. I just have some more, more gray hair that shows over <laughs> the years from, from some of these political battles. So. You bet. So at the end of 2022, if, if there's one state that you think we're going to, we're going to get it done in what, what state would that be? Oh man. I, <laughs> I'd love to be able to predict that. Um, yeah, I, I feel pretty good about Alabama. Um, really? yeah, I, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a lot of hard work, and we've got, you know, our field guy down there, DJ Parton. It seems like we're going to get something down there. Yeah. Whether we're going to be 100% happy with it, that's, that's to be seen. Um, but that, that seems to be one that seems to be the most sure, and that's, that's not saying much. I mean, like I, like I told you at the beginning here, I mean, it's just it's been a drag on for, like, weeks here where the, you know this time last year we we had some clear vision on what was going to happen in yeah. several states this time it's just like i i was feeling good going into this year oh we're going to get two three maybe four and i'm like oh, man if we just get one <laughs> yeah uh you know I'll, I'll be happy at this point um but sometimes it goes like this i mean things that are worth fighting for aren't easy yep. constitutional carry is worth fighting for and it's just an interesting political environment we're in right now. Um, and uh, and just trying to navigate those waters and try to 
you know, push, push this issue forward. You know, you, you've got this, this, you know, some even some of the issues with like the law and order Republicans making a comeback where, you know, that, that was an issue back in the 90s where, you know, there was a serious need for for, you know, for I mean, well, you look at our cities now. I mean, our, our cities are are howling, you know, they're they're ridden with crime because Democrats are just letting criminals do whatever they want. Sure. And you wonder why law abiding citizens want to arm themselves. <laughs> so it's just this in- interesting battle that you have with like. You know, the the, you know, the pro let's let's make let's fight crime versus gun rights. And those those wars within the Republican Party are are being fought right now. And we just got to. And the truth, truth be told, is that the rank and file law enforcement, they support constitutional carry. It's it's the out of touch brass like the Alabama Sheriff's Association Mm -hmm. who are teaming up with Moms Demand Action to oppose constitutional carry. You know, when you have the executive director of the Alabama Sheriff's Association come out and say he supports gutting the Second Amendment, you got problems. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> and we're, we're trying to draw that drive that wedge too. say, you know, th- these guys are out of touch. Um, you don't want to you know, you don't want to hang out with them. Yeah, you bet. Well, you, we can you definitely got your work cut out for you this year, but we're confident in your team and your abilities to keep kicking some political ass and i think uh when it's all said and done we'll we'll have some new constitutional carry states at the end of the year and we thank you for coming on the show brendan and uh hopefully we'll chat with you later this year to talk about our victories sounds good guys thanks Well, that just about does it for Tap Rack Bang for this week. Special thanks to the Director of Field Operations for the National Association for Gun Rights, Brendan Boudreaux, for joining the show. Yeah. Again, before we close it out, don't forget to visit all the links down in the description. Become an FLD member Mm. today. Help out our foundation. Like I said earlier, they got a huge battle in San Jose, California right now. They're suing their asses what they're doing. Exactly. Which is real fun. Don't forget to help out the podcast. Again, we're giving away those stickers. Those are down in the description, too. They cost literally nothing to you. So, uh, yeah, I think that'll do it. So uh, we'll see you next week. See you.